are still, because it's only the second week, talking about faith. Last week we gave this definition. Faith is knowing something is true even though you've not seen it or seen it yet. Now where would we get such a definition? Well, that's actually what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Let's all go there real quick and as we do a little review. And we're going there anyways. So Hebrews chapter 11. And the very first verse of Hebrews chapter 11 says, Now faith is. So gives a good definition of what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So the things we have not seen yet. What are examples of things that we have not seen yet? Heaven. Heaven, yeah. <laughs> that we have a place there. The new heaven and the new earth. What else have we not seen? Judgment. judgment. We haven't seen judgment and been, you know, basically absolved <laughs> and forgiven. We haven't seen that, but we have faith that it will happen. We haven't seen what? Jesus. Haven't seen Jesus come back yet. Uh, he hasn't come back yet. And again, as, you know, as the Bible tells us, some people say, well, if he hasn't come back yet, he's never coming. No, we have faith that he will keep his promise, right? In fact, in reality, there's a lot of promises in our daily life. We haven't seen him heal you yet if you're dealing with something, right? Does that mean he's not going to? No, we have faith that he can, and if it's right, he will. Uh, sometimes you're going through things and he has not provided yet, but we know that he what? Will. Uh, so faith is just putting your trust in him, even though you haven't seen it yet. It is the substance, a reality that things hoped for will be, and also the evidence of things not seen. So the thing, you haven't seen it. We looked last week. What's a good example of something you have not seen? Big list. How many saw creation? <laughs> no, but we have faith that God created the heavens and the earth, right? When? In the beginning. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Even then, I mean, we haven't seen Jesus. We didn't see him on the cross. We did not see him risen. But we have faith that that is true, even though we have not seen it. And the reality is we know these things to be true. And frankly, our faith would be worthless if they aren't. So even in this definition and in Hebrews chapter 11, 1, there's an assumption that if you put your faith in God then even though you haven't seen it, it's true. And even though you haven't seen it yet, it is true and will be true, right? So and that's the difference, because people put their faith in a lot of things, don't they? It's only when our faith in the truth and in God that we can stand firm in these things. Then we looked last week at that we are saved through grace by what? Faith. Right. This most critical thing in our life, the most important thing we can deal with in our life here on earth is What's going to happen after we die, right? That's the one thing we have to take care of. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is what? Yeah, so you got to take care of it. We need to be saved from that. And it is by grace, by the grace of God. It's not something we merit. It's not something we deserve. It's not because we were born here or born there or earned that or learned that, right? It is by grace, by what? Received by faith. That I trust God's promise. I trust he did what he did. I trust he loves me. Again, even though I haven't seen it or seen it yet, my faith says it's true. Unfortunately, it is. <laughs> right? It's worth putting your faith in. So we are saved through grace by faith, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. But that's not where our faith ends, is it? Do we just get saved? It's like, okay, faith is out the window. I've got that taken care of. Now faith doesn't matter. No. <laughs> no. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So there's kind of an implication there that we should not trust what? <laughs> what we perceive, what we see, what we believe, we should trust who? Trust God and walk by faith. And that's really what Verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a what? 
good report, right? What are you saying? Commendation. Commendation. So a reward. You did a good job. So does it matter? After we take that step of faith and receive salvation, does faith still matter? For it's by faith that we then live our life in a way that can do what? Please God. As it says later in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to what? Please God. So we have to walk every day by faith. And really, the rest of chapter 11, beginning in verse 5, is all about people in history who walked by what? Faith. And in different ways, they walked by faith. And we need to learn to walk as they walked. And in so doing, we can then obtain what? A good report. And hear from God what? Well done, my good and, wait for it, faithful <laughs> servant. <laughs> Do you catch it there? So what's key to hearing well done? Being a faithful. Now that's not being somebody who's trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly. You know. <laughs> it's not that kind of faithful, but one who walks by faith, who is full of faith, right? In the way we walk. So, let's get to it. And we're going to start actually in verse 4. I'm sorry. I was saying it said verse 5 earlier. But verse 4. We start our list of people who walk by faith. And the first one is really early. You can kind of count them down at this point. You have Adam, you've got Eve, you've got Cain, and you got Abel, and other brothers and sisters that never get any mention. <laughs> so, which just proves in history it's good to be either what? Really good or really bad. <laughs> right? Now, which one is Abel going to be if you walk by faith? Really good. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Matthew, can you read that for us? By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he attained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, did speak of it. Okay. So the example here is one who gave what kind of sacrifice by faith? Excellent. A more excellent sacrifice. In other words, sacrificed his best. Why would that require faith to sacrifice your best to God? Because then you don't have it. Because then you don't have it. <laughs> and therefore, you have to trust what? That God will provide. You also have to have faith that what? Sorry, no, I didn't. Oh, oh what were you going to say? I was just going to say, because I don't see it up there, I was, I was reading Malachi recently, uh -huh. and Malachi chastises the people in the priesthood for this for Abel's uh, or for Cain's sin basically he's like you despise me don't you because you're bringing me garbage <laughs> you're bringing garbage yeah. you're bringing whatever it's like oh well and then, again it's a faith that first of all God cares right does God care what we provide why should he why should God care what we give him because it's love because it's love does he have enough stuff, as he says in the Bible, what? I, I own all the cattle on all the hills. <laughs> it's all my, I don't need the stuff. I need your what? And then what Isaiah told the people, you're bringing me the stuff, but you're not bringing them with your what? Your heart, because it is a better sacrifice to give your best. It's the best, which takes faith because you don't have the best anymore but also faith that he cares and that he's worth it, right? And that he will accept it. That he will accept it and be happy with it, yes. Was it really ever yours, even? Yeah, well, yeah. Right? Like, it is all his. Yeah, yeah it's and faith so and understanding, right? right? In fact, let's go back and look at the story. Keep something in Hebrews chapter 11, because we're going to keep coming back there. But let's go to the story. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4 and see what the problem was with Cain on the other side. Genesis chapter 4, uh, we'll start in verse 1. So, 
At this point, Adam and Eve uh, were cast out of the garden, right? And as part of the curse, um, Eve was going to have difficulty in conceiving, and Adam was going to have to work hard. It's going to be hard to get the um, fruits of the land, right? So Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare her his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So we have a sheep herder and a farmer. Now, both of these are pretty critical <laughs> in that society, right? This very, very early society. Now, they did not eat the sheep. We don't see them eating meat until after Noah, actually. Uh, so what did they use the sheep for? Why were they so important? Clothes. Clothes. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, they made clothes, blankets, all those things. They probably made some parts of their housing. Who knows? I mean, they used them for a lot. The wool was very, very important. Uh, I don't know if they drank the milk. I have no idea. That would be a debate forever. <laughs> Should we be drinking milk? But, uh, that's, right. Yeah, that's right. Plus, they used them to sacrifice uh, those as well. Uh, they were already doing that. So, so. Uh, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground, uh, so he was growing the food. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Well, that's good, right? Isn't that what he's supposed to do? And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock, and of the fat, or the best thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So we have them both bringing sacrifice, but what was the difference? Abel brought what? The first and the best. Now actually, if you're any kind of, uh, I don't know how much they knew about breeding and things like that, but if you take all the best of your sheep, what happens to your herd over time? You know, the ones that give the best wool, the spotless wool, the perfect wool. You start sacrificing them, what happens to your flock over time is not going to have as good, right? But what did Abel say? It doesn't matter. It's not about the things of this earth. It's not about what I get. It's not what I can do. I'm going to trust God, right? And I'm going to give him the best because he deserves the best. He gave me the best, right? Meanwhile, what was Cain bringing? Just some, <laughs> just, just parts. And again, how easy would it be to say, you know, these apples are really good. These, they kind of fell early, maybe a little small. I'll just give those to God, right? And I'm going to give them that. And you know, we're, we're, we're reading a little bit in here, but there was something wrong with it, wasn't it? And God's very clear here to make a point that Abel is bringing the firstling and the fat thereof, and Cain's just bringing some, right? And so, God noticed that Cain was looking a little down. So, verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you so angry, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and sh thou shalt rule over him. So he says, Hey, if you just do what's right, if you bring me the best and sin, and see how faith plays in here? Where was Cain's faith? What did he believe? Well, he didn't, he didn't seem to realize that God could tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or that he would care. <laughs> that it matters. Not just matters in that you know, God would not be happy, but it matters how else. What did God say to him if he did not bring the best and did not have faith in God? What was going to happen? Further temptation would ensue. Yeah. <laughs> if your eyes get onto the thing, that's the thing. By faith you give the best because that takes your eyes off of the things and onto who? Right? And we have to do that by faith, don't we? Trust that he is worth it. <laughs> and in fact, it is best if. Now we know the story, don't we? What was Cain's solution? 
I will talk to my brother. No intention given here that he wanted to kill him, but he's going to talk to him. I don't know what he expected the conversation to be. It was Abel, stop bringing the good stuff. <laughs> so, come on, I don't want to give the best stuff. You know, God, God like you best. You know, a little Smothers Brothers going back and forth. I don't know. But eventually it got so heated that Cain ended up doing what? Killing him, burying him, hiding him. And once again, we have somebody trying to hide from God, right? After he's done some, something. Again, not understanding, clearly. But Abel gave the best, and that requires faith. Faith in God more than the things of the world. Faith in God more than what we see and what we perceive. Faith in God more than what the world values, right? And if we don't walk by faith and give him the best, what lies at the door, according to God? Sin. Sin. Because eventually that thing will take over, won't it? If we're not willing to give him the best, it will take over. In fact, what does the Bible say in the New Testament? Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Most of you, I'm sure, could just quote it. Uh, Derek, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay. So, I urge you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. And again, he's talking to people who are what? Saved. Saved. They're Christians. <laughs> he's talking to his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So they're taking this first step. They're saved by faith, right? But he's saying what? I beseech you, I urge you, you've got to do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, give the best of what to God? Everything you have, everything you are, <laughs> everything, right? To God. Give it to him wholly, right? So we need to look at things and say, okay, what is holy? What is good? What is best, right? And I'm going to sacrifice. And does it require sacrifice to be holy? What do we have to sacrifice in order to be holy? All the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lucy's on a diet right now, so she would just believe everything. <laughs> That is good in this world. But that's not true. Again, we have to by faith say what? Those are in fact not good. Right? To choose what is holy, what is perfect to God, we have to sacrifice what we perceive and what the world perceives as good, as positive, as gain, right? And we have to lay those things aside. We have to give our attitude. We have to give our desires. We have to give our will, right? And say, I will sacrifice those things for God's holiness, right? And is that easy? No, in fact, it's very, very, very hard. Now, if we don't do that by faith, what lies at the door? Sin lies at the door, right? And this is just this is reality matter. That's why we have to constantly walk by faith and say, okay, not my will, but thine be done, right? We may not even see how it's possible that it would be good. We may not even be able to see, you know, in our warped mind, we may be able to see that it is good. But if it's God's will, it is what? Good, acceptable. And perfect according to verse 2 <laughs> right and we have to do that we also have to do what is what acceptable unto God what is pleasing to God right. and again is that different than maybe what we want to do sometimes it is right? and we have to sacrifice and that requires faith right we have to believe 
Again, even though we may not believe so, the world may not teach us that, may not, believe, may not seem like it, God's way is the better way, right? And we have to be willing to sacrifice the best. So what do we have to sacrifice for God then? What are some examples of things we need to sacrifice for God? According to these verses. The best of our... Best of our life? Desires? Time? Resources? <laughs> we could keep going, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. And what we learned from Abel, is it best to give the best? Does God deserve the best? What we learned from Cain, if we don't, those things tend to start taking over, don't they? They become more important than who? God. And than then, God. And then we get killed. Yeah, then we get killed. <laughs> so, yeah. Actually, I love the story of Cain because uh, he actually gets the mark of Cain, doesn't he? Which is a good thing. It's a wonderful blessing of God, wasn't it? The mark of Cain was what? If anybody kills you, I'll kill him. <laughs> no. Is something wrong with the feet? to sacrifice the best, right? Unto them. And that requires faith. Let's look at the second example. Let's go to uh, Hebrews again. Chapter 11, verse 5. So, Abel is sacrifice. Enoch is to please God. Enoch, chapter 11, verse 5. Hebrews. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God has translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he what? Please God. Okay? So let's go look at that. Let's go look at this line of Enoch. Everybody go back to Genesis chapter 4. And this actually goes back to Abel. <laughs> Relates to the Abel story, so we'll start there. Genesis chapter 4, and we'll see, verse, first of all, verses 25 and 26. So after Abel was killed, and Cain was banished with the mark of Cain, and went off and started his own little group of not-so-nice people, <laughs> terrible line, what happened? And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, uh, for God said she had appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, not Enoch, Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? So, basically given Seth as a replacement. And basically what happened was we had this godly line of Seth. Now you like to say, well, yes, yeah, Seth had a bunch of kids, and they all loved God, and all their kids loved God, and all their kids loved God, and everybody was loving God, right? That'd be nice. That'd be nice to say, but that's not what was happening. In fact, basically what happened is the godly line of Seth started intermarrying with the evil line of Cain, and which way did people lean then? Away. It's kind of like when they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had a choice, right? When they knew how to do good and do bad, which one, which one do we choose? <laughs> More often than not, <laughs> to do evil, right? The same here. Uh, they started intermingling. They just kept getting worse. But God always preserved kind of a little line down through history, one little family of each generation that would follow God. Okay, and one of those was Enoch. So let's go to chapter five, verse six. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos, and Seth lived, uh, after he begat Enos, 807 years and begat sons and daughters. Look at those years, man. Those some long times. When did things change where people weren't living 800, 900 years? After the flood, after the flood so. Water kills. <laughs> 
Verse 9, Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan, and Enos lived after he begat Canaan 815 years, begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahalalel, and Canaan lived after he begat Mahalalel uh, 840 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. See a theme here, by the way? How do people end? They die. They die. <laughs> and that's important, though. Because all of a sudden we're going to have a guy here soon that doesn't. And Mahalalel lived six and five years and begat Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begat uh, Jared 830 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and five years. And he died. And Jared lived eight, uh, 160 and two years. And he begat Enoch. There we go. We're finally there, right? So you see this little godly line that God is preserving down through. They're living a long time. They have a son. And then that son has a family, but he they, they're a godly line, right? And he's going on down. We get to Enoch. There's something different happens when Enoch. Verse 19, And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. So, this is where we go to the chart. Everybody ready for the chart? All right. We have Enoch here. He was born, and at 65 years old, he had who? Methuselah. Methuselah lived longer than anybody else recorded in the Bible. Other than his dad, which we'll get to in a second. So, Enoch lived 65 years and had Methuselah, and then he lived, Enoch lived 300 years after that. Well, what happened after the 300 years? That's a very short period of time back then, right? These people were living 900 years. He's only 365 years old. He's a young man. <laughs> he's, he's practically middle-aged, right? Today, it'd be equivalent to being 55 years old. He's got a lot of life left in him, right? <laughs> but what, don't laugh at me. <laughs> but what happened? And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, verse 21, begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What's different than every other description of everybody else? He lived 300 years after he begat Methuselah. And if he was anybody else, what would he have said? And he died. <laughs> It doesn't say that. It says instead what? God took him. And as we learn from Hebrews, it says it was translated. So if there was any confusion after writing of Genesis about what walking with God meant. He was the first missing person. Yeah, first missing person. He was on you know, goat's milk cartons everywhere. Anybody seen? Has anybody seen Enoch? <laughs> Looking for my dad. Wasn't even crazy. Wasn't even very really old. He was only 365 years old. So, so he lived 300 years and then he was translated. I find this interesting because he disappeared 69 years before Noah was born. What was the world like? Because way back, right after, uh, during the time of Enos, which is the son of Seth, you already had the line of Seth intermarrying with the line of Cain. And he already had evil spreading throughout the world. And now, hundreds of years later, we have Enoch born. And that's why I want to make sure, that's why I did the chart. I want to understand. It's not like, oh yeah, sure. Of course he pleased God, because everybody pleased God. Right? Everybody was following God. Everybody loved God and worshipped God. And, and No. Already the times were getting what? Because what's going to happen during the time of Noah? 69 years after Enoch leaves, Noah's born. And what's the world like when Noah's born? The rest of us get wiped out. What's that? The rest of us get wiped out. Yeah. <laughs> People's imagination was evil all the time only. <laughs> right? And that's really the time frame that Enoch lived in. Already... 
The world was so bad that God was questioning why he even made mankind on the earth. And it was only going to get worse. Who knew that? Yeah, God. It's almost like God said, okay, <laughs> this generation, this next 69 years, things are just going to get worse and worse. I know a lot of people today are like, oh, this is the worst the world has ever been. Oh. I, I love people who have no concept of history. but <laughs> None. I mean, but things were going to get rough really bad, weren't they? And this is like, hey, in spite of that, in spite of everything that was going on in his society, no matter as it was getting worse and worse and worse, what did Enoch do? Walk with God. He what? By faith, pleased God. Right? Therefore God said what? I'm taking you out of this mess. Because what happened after Enoch left? Well, Methuselah lived 187 years, and then he had Lamech. He lived 782 years after that. So he was here when Noah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the cool thing. If you look at this chart, if you add it up, the year the flood came is the year Methuselah died. Okay. I've heard that that's what his name meant. When he dies, it comes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so he died that. before. Kind of his long We're life. assuming. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. Because Methuselah lived right up to the flood. Because you add it up, Lamech was 182 when he had Noah. Noah then lived 500 years before he had Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So in here, during his time, he had Ham, Shem, and Japheth. The last one was born then. Then it was 100 years, and then the flood. Because it says after the flood, he lived 350 years. And you add up his entire time of 950 years, that means it was 100 years between when Ham, Shem, and Japheth were born, the last one born, and when the flood came, which gives you exactly 782 years after Lamech was born. So it's exactly. In fact, Lamech died five years before the flood. Okay. So basically, what did God do before the flood? Cleared the decks. Enoch was gone. Methuselah was gone. Lamech was gone. The only one left was who? Noah and his three sons. And that was it. So, God know what he's doing. But in spite of all of this going on, what did Enoch do by faith? Please, God. Now, why is that so hard? Why does it take faith to please God? He's great. Well, he was surrounded by people that work. Yeah. What happens when you stand up and say, I will do what is pleasing to God, not pleasing to men? Who doesn't like that? The people. <laughs> right? In fact, let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writing this to the church there in Thessalonica, which knew something about this. How hard would it have been to stand up and be a Gentile in Thessalonica, a Greek, <laughs> who said, I'm going to trust in God, not the gods of this city. What, what, what may I lose? Position? Family? Friends? Friends? Business? Business? I mean... You know, livelihood, you know, respect, maybe even been thrown in prison, may have been attacked, may have been, you know, physically injured. I mean, and he says what here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Bob, can you read verses 1 and 2, please? Furthermore, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Okay. I find this interesting because what does uh, Romans 12, 2 say? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, right? How does this one start? Furthermore, we beseech you. <laughs> so, first one is to what? First one is we beseech you to sacrifice. This one is what? We beseech you to please God. And everything we have taught you. We need you to walk 
and to please God by following his commandments, not your own, not the world's, right? Back look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now this is one certain area, right, which is immorality. They lived in a city, in a society, and what was their perspective on morality? It was driven by a sex god, basically. <laughs> That's what Thessalonica was dominated by, right? And he's saying, hey, you guys know better. But again, how hard is that? How hard is it to be the only one at work that doesn't curse? How is it to be the only one at school who doesn't drink? How is it to be the only one amongst your friends who doesn't smoke or do drugs or do marijuana? Or how is it to be the only one in the locker room who's never had premarital sex? I mean, how hard is that? It can be hard. And now we live in a society where there's a lot of other Christians. There's a lot of other people who live that same way. What about during the time of Enoch? What about the city of Thessalonica? That's a little harder, isn't it? And what does it say? I want you to be sanctified. I want you to be set apart and holy for service unto God to his pleasure, right? And that requires what? Faith. Faith that I need to please God and not man or myself. In fact, let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, Amy, you want to read that for everybody? now seeking the approval of God I mean of man or of God or am I trying to please man if I were still trying to please men I would not be a servant of Christ okay so the question is why are you preaching the stuff you do Paul <laughs> why are you saying the things you're saying Paul and his answer is what well I don't say these things to please people do people preach things just to please people sure. some of them do some do yeah do people give advice just to please people? I mean, how many times throughout history, throughout the Bible, were there prophets who spoke in the name of God who just told people what they wanted to hear? Should that be what we're doing? But it, that requires some faith, doesn't it? Because isn't it easier just to tell people what they want to hear? <laughs> Well, you know, wouldn't we be more popular? Wouldn't we uh, be... I, we could write books, right? I could, I could write books. I could go on a circuit, man. I could get out there and I could make a lot of money tell, tell people what they want to hear, you know? What's harder? Telling the truth, which they may not want to hear, right? And we have to decide. We're going to please. And let's face it, during the time of Jesus, wasn't that problem with the Pharisees? What do you see as one of their number one problems? They wanted to please who? People, the government. People, the government, men, right? <laughs> they wanted to do what was pleasing unto those around them so they could keep their power, keep their position, keep this, keep that, right? And we gotta sit there and say, no. By faith, there's only one person that I wanna hear well done from. There's only one person that I want to please. And I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm going to please God. But that requires what? Why does that require faith? Because, because it could be uncomfortable. <laughs> it could be so what do you what do you what's your faith? What, what are you putting? What are you trusting? That it's the right thing. Or that God is okay. That it's the right thing, right? They may kill you. 
unlikely in our society. But, but that's still okay. But then what did Paul say? For me to live is Christ, to die is... And that requires faith, right? For Paul, that meant being thrown in prison. That meant being beaten. That meant being shipwrecked. That meant being beaten by an ass. <laughs> it meant being imprisoned and hauled all over the world for two years. <laughs> Going to Rome under house arrest. I mean, it meant so much. But he says what? I don't do this to please men. I do this to please God and then let the chips fall where they may, right? And not do it for ourselves either. Right. Because we have to. Yeah. Yeah. We're not. It ties into what you said last week too about how much of this we haven't seen. It's like we're, we're trusting that it's the right thing to do, but we're also just trusting that it's right. Right. Like everyone else is telling us, no, this is the right way to go instead. We're like, no, God says this. Right. We're trusting something we haven't seen to be the right thing to do. Right. <laughs> And the world can often come up with some, what they believe, very good arguments for what they do, don't they? They sound really good. They sound loving. <laughs> they sound, you know, good. They'll even pull out some verses every once in a while and try to <laughs> make it sound great and couch in religion and patriotism and everything else, right? They all sound good. But we have to look at it and say, no, is it true and therefore pleasing who? We gotta stand up no matter who stands with us and say, I will trust the truth. I will do it right. Okay? And that's not easy. But was it easy for Enoch, was it? Was it easy until God said what? Let's take a walk. <laughs> and it got easy. Here's an interesting little tidbit. The first two in this chapter are Abel and Enoch. Abel? First one to die and go to heaven. It was paradise. So, so he was the longest time in paradise. Enoch, first one living to go to heaven. <laughs> so, so uh, pretty good couple of guys to start with, right? So, and both uh, both received their rewards. Okay. Any questions or thoughts? One went by death and one went by not dying, which is what's going to happen to us. Right. And these are two examples of you know, what happens. Um, you know, we have the rapture, possibly. Um, and we, it's not because we please God with our works, but because we please God with our faith. Right? And, uh, yep. Or we can go by death. Either one. We're putting our faith, though, <laughs> that that's what's going to happen. <laughs> that this is all worthwhile. Because as Paul says, if uh, this is all just here and now, and we just all die and become fertilizer, we're above all people just most miserable, right? We're doing this for nothing. We're, we're pleasing a God that doesn't exist, and we're doing this for no reason whatsoever and causing all this hardship. We might as well just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? But by faith, we know that's not true. <laughs> this is all worth it all, right? I mean, we learn in Psalm 1 that this can be, we can either uh, atrophy or grow in our faith by where and how we spend our time, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we're, you know, just by based on by some who we spend our time with and whether or not we are meditating and abiding in the Word is, is going to play a big part in whether we're like that tree that bears fruit or one that kind of withers and So, as we go out into this world, because we are in this world, right? In the world, but not of the world, right? we got to go out there, and we need to make sure every day we are giving God our best. And by faith, we can do that, can't we? Trusting Him to give us the strength to do it, and also the knowledge that it is worth it, and He deserves it. And also, as we go out, just make sure that we are pleasing God, not ourselves, not other people, but everything we do is meant to please God. And again, by faith, we can do that. Uh, trusting him to give us that knowledge and understanding of what we should do and also the power to do it and uh, the knowledge that it is worth it. Okay. Any other thoughts? All right, let's pray.